um, and getting the the tech thing um, organized. Um, Justin, just introduce yourself and uh, tell us why you're joining us here today. Uh, so I'm a basically a community doctor from uh, Toronto in, in Canada. Uh, and then I spend a little bit or maybe way too much time uh, reading some uh, medical literature and uh, writing a bit about it on on my blog, First 10 EM, and then chatting with it. You had uh, my partner in crime, Casey Parker, on from a couple of weeks ago from our podcast where we do a eh, not quite monthly journal club doing some of the same kind of stuff. You've taken a very much a sort of evidence-based emergency medicine approach over the years. And the, the first time in blog's pretty good. No, it's very good. It's better than us. And um, it's it's a, if you're interested in critical appraisal and really looking at the literature, um, I'd, I'd recommend it. I mean, you work with uh, Salim and Casey and, and a lot of the other people who've been through the SMAC organization. Um, there's some really good quality stuff there. So if, if people haven't been there, I would go. And Rick, I think Thank you're you. live. Thanks, Simon. That's great. So, um, we're very pleased to have Justin with us. Uh, as you can see, we've also got a terrific all-star cast that we've had for the last few weeks. We're very lucky to have Simon Carley, Anissa Jaffa, Charlie Raynard from Emergency Medicine, and Pam Valerie and Paul Clapper from Virology. So uh, we'll be taking you through, as usual, a deep dive and five rapid-fire papers. So if you want to ask any questions, please do use the Q&A function. You can also get in touch with us using the chat function that allows you to communicate with all of the other um, people who are attending as well. Um, this is what we've got. So the deep dive that we're going to do is looking at viral shedding and transmissibility. Really interesting paper with a lot of implications for social distancing. And then we've got five papers, as I say, that we're going to go through. Justin is going to take us through this deep dive it's a little unusual, certainly not your usual standard RCT or diagnostic accuracy study. It's a little off the wall, but as you'll see, it's very relevant to our practice. So over to you, Justin. Yeah, I mean, emergency medicine sort of uh, is a specialty that really by definition focuses on symptoms. And now we're talking a lot about pre-symptomatic. That's not really a word we used before, but we've heard about people potentially spreading this disease before they have uh, symptoms. And that was going to really matter a lot for us because it's true. It, it matters a lot for how we protect ourselves. It matters for how we manage this disease. You can't just isolate the people with, uh, with symptoms. That's not going to work. And it matters for our risk assessments. You can't just ask people, have they been in contact with anybody sick? Because that's not going to matter nearly as much if pre-symptomatic spread uh, changes. Uh, so in terms of the methods, we could probably go ahead and slide. Uh, this is actually two different uh, papers within the, uh, within the same write-up. Uh, I don't believe I can advance the slides, correct? That's on you, Rick. I do. Um, so part one of the uh, paper is actually pretty simple. It's, it's 94 patient, patients who were admitted to a single center in China, all of whom have confirmed COVID-19. And then they took repeat swabs over the course of the next 30 days and just looked at the viral loads on each of those uh, swabs. So re really simple methodology. Unfortunately, and we'll come back to this, they, they didn't give us any information about when or why they decided to do those swabs. Um, in terms of part two of this study, um, they looked at 77 transmission pairs. Now, these aren't their, this isn't their own data. This is data that they collected from open source. So this is already published data. And they define a transmission pair as uh, two people where one is highly likely to have become infected from the other. And that's obviously really hard to confirm, but their criteria are at least reasonable, I think. Basically, um, the, in, the, the second person to get infected couldn't have traveled or come in contact with any confirmed or suspected case within the 14 days before they got, got sick. The two couldn't be part of a larger cluster of patients, and the two couldn't have a common uh, source. Uh, so there couldn't be a third person uh, who got sick, or a, a, they couldn't have both gone to a place where COVID was uh, suspected. So there's a pretty reasonable guess that person B got the disease from person A, and then they use that data to compare the, the, the timing of symptom onset. Um, so in terms of results, the, uh, for part one of this uh, study, their admitted patients, they were a mean age of 47, half were female. It's a pretty mildly sick uh, uh, group. They, don't say that, they say that nobody was in their severe or critically uh, ill categories on the day of admission. And they did 414 different swabs from these 94 patients, so about an average of four each, over the next 32 days. And basically what they report is that the highest viral loads were on the first swab and they trended down over time towards the limit of detection by day uh, 21. Um, so highest viral loads on, on the very first swab 
But if you look at the uh, figure, uh, figure two, I believe, from this paper will come up. Uh, this is not necessarily the cleanest data set you'll ever see. The, the trend line doesn't match beautifully with this overall big cluster of, of points uh, there. Um, so you really need a stats nerd to, to really trust those trend lines. Um, in terms of part two of the, the paper, um, really simple results. The median time between when person one developed symptoms and person two developed symptoms was 5.2 days. And exactly what that means depends a lot on the incubation of the disease. Uh, and so they do a couple of sensitivity analyses uh, to account for di uh, different possible models. And it's basically that they infer, and this is all modeling, that infectiousness started 2.3 days before the symptoms and that the peak infectivity would have been 0.7 days before symptoms. And based on those numbers, they say that 44% of the transmission would have happened before a person became symptomatic. Um, there's also a figure from this paper. It, it's probably too messy for a webcast format, but I think it's really interesting if you look closely, uh, because you'll see there's a bunch of cases in there. Green is the day when, uh, when the people were together. And right in the middle, there's a, uh, at towards 41, 42, there's a bunch of people who only were together before either one of them got, had, uh, symptoms. And then they both got sick, which I find sort of fascinating. So th that's it from the methods and, uh, results section. I find this data really, really interesting. What they're suggesting is that about half of transmission will occur before patients have symptoms and that their viral loads will be highest early on, maybe even highest before they develop any symptoms. Um, this is hard for just an eMERGE doc to, to interpret. So I think we'll kick it over to our, our, our experts. I had sort of three quick comments that I would make from a critical appraisal standpoint. Uh, number one, I already sort of mentioned, in terms of repeat swabs, we're missing a major piece of information. They don't tell us at all why they did these follow-up swabs. They weren't on a set schedule, I, I don't think. Uh, so bias is, if, if not possible, probably maybe even probable, because you can imagine there's sort of two ways this could, could go. You could have a patient who was doing fine for a few days and then all of a sudden gets sick, has a fever, or has new symptoms, and they might re-swab that patient. And in that case, you would expect the viral loads to be higher. What I think actually happened is, you are trying to use these swabs in order to either discharge the patient from the hospital or take them off isolation. So you're only ever gonna do the swabs on patients who are healthy. You're not gonna swab the really sick person because they're not gonna go any, anywhere. And that would bias the results to say that the, the, the repeat swabs are gonna have lower viral loads. Uh, I think the other major limitation to think about in terms of part one of this paper is that the symptoms are based on recall bias uh, or on recall. So recall bias is possible. And I don't know about any, everybody else here, but I wake up almost every day with symptoms that could be COVID, right? I, I got, I got fatigue. I, I got muscle aches. It is allergy season here. So I could have some nasal congestion. Now I'm fine for the rest of the day. So I ignore those symptoms, but if I tested positive tomorrow in retrospect, I might think that those were symptoms of COVID for longer than I actually had. And I guess the one other thing I would say about this uh, data, the one other big source of potential bias is that during an outbreak, I think that the data is always going to be skewed to make pre-symptomatic spread look like a bigger contributor. And the reason for that is we isolate people once their symptoms start. So by definition, you can't really spread the disease once you're stuck, stuck in your house. So you're out in public when you have no symptoms, you spread the disease. Once you're in your house, you don't spread the, spread the disease, but that doesn't make you inherently uh, more or less infectious, which matters to us who are seeing the people in the, ho in the hospital. Uh, and with that, I think I've said more than enough and I should turn it over to the panel. Thanks a lot, Justin. That's a really interesting off the wall paper. And as you say, lots of things for our expert virologists to discuss there. So I'm gonna go, let's go straight away to Pam for an opinion. Yeah. I. I I'm not sure I can add anything. That was a brilliant analysis, Justin. That was really good. Um, yeah, so I, I agree with you. That it's, it was, you know, I, I called it quite a convoluted paper. There were a lot of assumptions made in it um, and a lot of kind of modelling that um, maybe drew, drew more conclusions than they actually had the data for. Um, yeah, you know, again, I would I would completely agree with you. They didn't sort of do the, the swabbing in any um, logical or... or, or sustained sort of manner um they, they didn't give us the information really about how they'd and done the swabbing and what the time intervals were um around it a again you know it just sort of says it said they were initially the throat swab was was positive and then they took repeat samples from that you know again were they taking samples from the 
upper respiratory tract, the lower respiratory tract, you know, it, potentially there could be some sort of sampling bias there as well. But, you know, having said all of that, I think the evidence that, that the virus is spreading before symptoms appear um, from this paper, but there have also been a few other papers out of China that suggest that that's true. And I think that we, you know, really have to accept that that probably is a possibility, you know, whether it's for 2.3 days prior to it or whether it's for a shorter or a longer period. Um, I'm not sure I you know, completely put, put my, um, my uh, uh, faith in this paper for, for that exact time. But, um, you know, I think the possibility and the, the likelihood um, that it is spreading um, before symptoms appear is important. And then when we come to talk about the, um, the social distancing paper later, I think you know, it's got implications for that as well. Uh, because clearly if it's being spread before symptoms then it's being spread in aerosols and not in, in droplets. So, yeah. I don't know if you've got anything else, Paul, that you want to add into that? Well, I was going to say it's very topical because, you know, we're now talking about coming out of lockdown and how we will manage that. And of course, here, we, here we've got clear evidence that your highest level of infectivity is before you ever get symptoms. And it, the data in this paper dovetails quite nicely with one which has appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine about pre-symptomatic infections in a closed community, a nursing home. And there they showed exactly the same thing that patients were in were infectious two to three days before they actually developed symptoms. And the other interesting thing in that closed community was the number of infections where it was completely silent infection. Not all the patients were symptomatic. So you translate that into the wider population and ooh, <laughs> it's going to be quite difficult to control if the, if the virus is still spreading person to person in the community and they, then we suddenly release people uh, from lockdown and social mixing starts again. But is this something that we can actually do anything about? People are transmitting it before they get symptoms. What on earth can we do about it? Because we have to ease the social distancing measures at some point. Yes. I, people have talked about, about measuring temperatures in public as a, as a way of mass measure. And you, and you would pick up a few people like that. But the vast majority, it sounds like, are, are not going to show symptoms and are going to be infectious. So... The, the measures that they used in South Korea, which people think are really draconian, but worked, which was mass testing and having um, everyone tracked in their movements and then doing contact tracing from ones who developed the infection is possibly the only way of doing it. The sort of half-hearted measures that we're seeing introduced into the Isle of Wight this week, where you can download an app or you're not, don't necessarily need to download an app and then will we actually be able to contact trace because we don't actually have the, the the volume of contact tracing stuff that they had in in korea it makes you wonder that ooh, we might have problems with it in our country and possibly also in europe in uh, in actually controlling things as we come out of lockdown yeah it seems like it'll be very difficult to enforce downloading of the app if they do try and roll it out to the whole country yes yeah, yeah I mean, we, I mean, we have to accept that once social social distancing is relaxed we're going to get a lot more cases again yeah. gonna unless we get a wonderful summer like last year and, and we have uh, sunshine every day and that will reduce the risk of transmission <laughs> I'm hoping but, it's sunny today. Yeah, you're right. For those who don't know, we're in Manchester. I think Paul's <laughs> aspirations are quite unlikely, actually. Can I ask a, can I ask a really naive question um, to, to Pam and Paul? And it's in, in this paper, and one of the other papers we're going to be talking about later, is this concept of viral load and how much virus you're shedding. I mean, how much virus do you need to get to sort of, sort of kick off a, an infection? So presumably at some point, people will be shedding lots of virus, they're highly infective. At which point do they, it's, it's, a, it's not a yes or no question, is it? It's not a yes or no, no. you are infected, you're not infected. Yes. At yes. some point, you reach the point where it's pretty damned unlikely you're going to infect somebody else. But do we have a feel for what that is with uh, COVID-19? Well, I'm just going to say, theoretically, you need one viral particle. But, um, you know, clearly your immune system will do something, you know, your innate immune system will do something to, to fight that off. But the, the higher the viral load, the more viral particles there are, the more chance you've got of being infected. 
Yeah. That links nicely with a question from uh, one of the, from Richard, uh, who says actually, although viral load is um, is higher than before, higher before symptoms, is it the case that the chance of transmitting the disease is lo is lower than when symptomatic if you're not coughing and sneezing? Ah, well that brings on the the paper of social distancing. What I was going to say about viral load is I'm always shouting at our students about using viral load as a as sort of jargon term because viral load actually relates to the amount of virus present in a volume of fluid. So it arose from the amount of virus present in blood. When we translate this into measuring in throat swabs, we also have to factor in that the quality of the throat swab depends, has an influence on how much virus we recover. So it's not an exact measure when we're, we're looking at, at throat swabs. It gives us an indication, yes, there's virus there and there's, there's plenty of virus in this throat swab. But you could do a throat swab tomorrow and a poor throat swab and actually not recover any virus. But the virus is still there in the throat simply because they haven't, haven't efficiently um, swabbed the throat. So it's quite difficult to relate throat swabs to risk of transmission. You can get a general idea, but trying to be precise is going to be very difficult. That's People really... have tried doing saliva as an alternative or just nasal fluid as, a, as an alternative in, in the idea that you could be able to collect a specific volume of it and quantitate better. But the, the efficiency in, of, of detection in saliva and in nasal fluids is lower than a proper, properly constituted uh, swab that will collect epithelial cells as well as the virus in the secretions. Thanks, Paul. So um, before we move on to the next paper, which is also on social distancing and related, let's just go back to Justin, see if you've got any final comments uh, to wrap up this paper. No, I think that, that's all brilliant. I had not even considered the fact that this might just all be random noise from, from swabs. Um, so it's hard to know what to do uh, clinically, but I think it, you, we wrap it up. It, it's, we have to assume that there is pre-symptomatic uh, spread and proceed uh, accordingly, which is more of a uh, question for our public health uh, people than us in the emergency department, I think. Brilliant. So let's move on to our rapid fire round. We're going to go through uh, five papers um, with less detail, so we get good coverage of the literature. Because we try to pull out the things that we think are most interesting um, that's been published over the last week or so. And we're going to go to Anissa to take us through this next paper, which is again very relevant to social distancing on um, airborne or droplet precautions for health workers. Thanks, Rick. Um, and it's going to be really interesting, I think, to hear from um, Pam and Paul at the end of this as well. So everyone will be probably fairly familiar um, with this one to two meter rule um, that we've been considering based on the idea that droplets can't be transmitted further than this. And lots of guidance has been um, centered around this, this idea. But this, this study um, looked at what the evidence actually is behind that um, because it is a very commonly adoptive sort of pre preventative assumption. And what they found um, based on their, their um, reviewed the literature was that the data didn't actually support um, this one to two meter rule and eight out of the specific 10 studies that they were focusing upon um, showed that droplets can travel over two meters horizontally um, and in some key cases it was shown to be more than eight meters and we, we know from uh, Paul um, mentioned to us um, the other day about a little experiment he'd done um, with school children to sort of demonstrate this. So this is um, it, it, causes us a little bit of a problem when we base um, a lot of what we're doing on something that actually isn't very evidence-based. And in terms of COVID-19 specifically, um, even aerosol transmission has been shown to be potentially um, happening at four metres from a patient. And what they talk about as well within the paper is that actually dividing the idea of droplet transmission from airborne spread is just not this straightforward black and white thing where you can say, we need to do this in this situation, we need to do that in that situation. There's much more of a continuum. And um, the concept of low risk and high risk interactions do sort of then get called into question. Um, the other thing that they pointed out was that virus can actually also be found in the air about three hours after aerosolization, um, which again calls into question the premise on which we're basing some of our working practice. Um, it was a fairly robust search strategy uh, of the literature. There were a wide selection of studies um, and they did 
use different models of approach to answer the question. Um, some of it was um, sort of computer modeling, some of it was more sort of physical experiments, simulated coughs, etc. Not all of them would be directly um, relevant to the hospital environment, and there's lots of things to consider when we, we think about this research um, at face value. But it, it does kind of call into question um, the way that we're functioning based on the evidence that actually doesn't support the, the rules that have been set in place. Um, the paper does suggest the need to be a bit more cautious and the idea of putting patients perhaps in surgical masks as well as caregivers um, is justified to limit um, spread as much as possible. It's hard to know how we translate this into actual practice um, and, the, and uh, it'll be interesting to hear from Pam and Paul about this how we actually interpret that and how we change what we do. I think one of the, the things I've taken from it is that there's no such thing as any absolutes, there's no such thing as an environment you can create which will completely and utterly eradicate um, the virus's capacity to spread. What we can do is, is, is mitigate risk, reduce risk, and trying to um, get that across, um, particularly to the population as social distancing um, is implemented and as we are released from lockdown, that there, there cannot be a, a position where we prevent entirely, but we can reduce risk. So we, we need to not feel entirely powerless. Simple measures like coughing into your elbow, for example, it might not stop everything, but it, it, it is going to make a difference to transmission. And um, we have to remember things like that. Um, at the same time, pulling out sort of a, a rule that suggests that everybody needs to wear respirator masks for absolutely everything would just be untenable. And we know that based on PPE shortages, um, et cetera. So um, I wish I was presenting some kind of a friendly, happy solution here. Um, and it does kind of throw up more questions and answers. Um, but I think the reminder has to be that this is reducing risk and this has demonstrated that, okay, fine, the way we're working isn't necessarily fully evidence-based, but equally from a personal perspective, if I knew somebody was infect infected, I would prefer to be two metres away than two centimetres away because that would put me at, um, at, at lower risk. And I think we have to think about it perhaps a little bit like that. So um, Pam and Paul, please comment away. So there's plenty to discuss with this one. Um, but I think the bottom line here is you don't read this paper and think, oh my gosh, we've all got to stay eight metres apart all of the time and like you say, wear respirator masks. So let's have some thoughts from the panel about uh, how we can interpret this in a more pragmatic way uh, than, you know, than that overreaction that you talked about, Anissa. So, so there's, there's, there is a body of evidence which is used in the design of hospital premises and healthcare premises, which looked at droplet spread, and that's where the one to two meters came from. But the droplets they're talking about are quite large droplets that you can see and that you can photograph. So the pictures you see of people sneezing, you know, are large droplets. What you don't capture on, on most of these photographs are the micro droplets, which because they're lighter and smaller spread further. And of course they can contain substantial amounts of virus as well. And so the idea that we want two meters and you're completely safe is wrong. It is, it is a matter of distance because the studies that have come from, particularly from MIT, showing that, you know, it, when you sneeze, on average, the, the virus will travel at least seven to eight metres. But of course, in that seven to eight metres, you can have the highest concentration close to the person and it's going to be lower concentration further out and then it's the then you have to breathe it in it's the efficiency with which that virus can then can then enter you so distance is important and in a healthcare setting where you've got patients who will be excreting virus that's the reason for PPE and good PPE which will protect you from infection in the wider population they're now talking about using masks but actually, if you look at the efficiency of using masks in the general population and actually watch what people do when they're using masks, you see them, they go in talking to their mates. So they drop the mask down and talk to them face to face. Or if they're going to sneeze, they drop the mask down, have a sneeze and put the mask back up. That's the reality of, 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 of using masks in the general population. There's a considerable educational need. Uh, to, to, to try and reinforce the idea that distance is important and if you are going to use a mask, use it properly. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree with all of that. Certainly, um, you know, the, if you just think about the sort of logistics of it, the, then the large particles from a sneeze or a cough, the big air droplets, don't go as far. Okay, you would, I think we're coming to the understanding that there is virus in the very tiny aerosol particles that go a long way, but as they move away from you, they disperse. And so your chances, of some, the chances of somebody else breathing in enough of those very small viral particles to become infected is very, you know, massively reduced the further away um, that the air particle gets from the person who sneezed. So, you know, I, I think, you know, it's not a case of panicking and thinking that everybody in a, an entire ICU is going to get infected from aerosol droplets. I, you know, that I, I don't think that's that's the case at all. I think the point that somebody made about potentially whether patients should be wearing masks to prevent those droplets from spreading very far, I think that's perhaps a you know a good point. And you know, I I don't particularly know what happens in an ICU setting, but uh, certainly preventing the spread from the patient to you that the mask could have a, a, a good um, benefit in that particular instance, I think. Can I ask Justin a little bit about this one? Because it's a topic which we've talked about a lot, Justin, is um, whether these are patient or in this case, healthcare related outcomes, or whether these are just sort of theoretical outcomes where we're trying to take this data and imply it into clinical practice, because it's not really a clinical outcome in this paper. Yeah, I mean, the problem is measuring clinical outcomes here, just like we said in the first one, it's so hard to know who you caught the virus from, and it happens five days, days later. So I, I don't know how you would design the trial to make it a true clinical or patient oriented outcome. Um, I, I would echo every, I was actually the one I think who suggested this paper. And I, the last thing I, I want, I think it's an important paper because you, uh, we don't want to be very black and white in medicine. I think this is a great paper for sort of busting the myths knowing that, oh, definitely one meter, definitely two meters, we're going to be safe. But at, this, at the same time, we definitely don't want people to be overly stressed out by this data. Because as we said, the further you get away, everything spreads through 3D space. And basically every bit you move away, you're going to be safer and safer and safer. And we have to consider the harms as well. We love, we love talking about, um, you know, seeing a paper like this and be like, oh, I should just move four or eight meters away from the patient and then take off my PPE. But if you move eight meters away from the patient, now you're dragging your dirty PPE eight meters into the department. Uh, and so it's not a, there is risks and uh, benefits to everything that, that we do. And so I think this paper tells me that if I had a door to go behind an anteroom, I would love to use that because there is no safe distance. But if you don't, I think you have to design it based on the space of your own department and realize that actually most of the time, I, right now, I've read all this data, I still take my PPE off about two meters away from most patients unless they're critically ill and coughing and spewing stuff uh, and I can't get a mask on them for some reason. Two meters is still enough for me most of the time. A couple of questions come in. Um, there's a point here from Mian. Uh, how about educating people on the proper way of wearing masks and safely disposing of them, which I think is a good point, absolutely, but really difficult to do. And then just in the interest of time, we'll move on to the second question. Given this is the design of a room and department, ventilation, height of ceiling, walls, etc. therefore, is that more important than PPE, the, the ventilation, the height of the ceiling, the, the walls, and so on? Equally important, I would say. The, the, the design of healthcare facilities are to try and protect you anyway, even without PPE. Because remember, you know, this, this we, we get virus, respiratory virus infections all the time in, 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 in healthcare. And so some of the, the design of healthcare facilities is designed to prevent cross infection. And, and so the ventilation systems are designed with that in mind and the premises are designed with that in mind and the, the surfaces in the rooms are designed to try and minimise uh, transmission of viruses when viruses settle on them. Yeah, interestingly, you know, the last uh, month or, or so, Paul and I have got quite involved with a lot of people who are interested in, you know, how can PPE be improved to, to help um, combat viral infections? You know, is the design of you know, engineers and mathematicians and all sorts of people are sort of talking to us. And so I think, you know, as a result of this, there will be some improvements perhaps um, or, or innovations that come out of, uh, uh, you know, improving the environment in the, in the ICU maybe. Hmm. Interesting. We're, we're kind of stuck with what we got, I guess, for this wave of the pandemic um, and perhaps realising that some of the designs of our emergency departments might not be ideally suited to pandemic responses. Uh, but that's what we got. 
Um, and the other thing I'd like to just mention is I think that it, as well as uh, recognizing the risk that, po that patients pose for healthcare worker infections, we, we all pose a risk to each other as well. And social distancing between healthcare workers is a big issue. And that's also related to the design of the department. Um, in the interest of time, we should move on to our next paper. So Simon's going to take us through something that is very topical. We covered a paper on remdesivir in week one, but now this is really heated up as an issue. And so Simon's going to take us through a paper in the New England Journal. Um, it's the Lancet, actually, with this one. Um, Rick, oh, they're all over the place um, at the moment. So, yeah, this is um, a paper on uh, remdesivir. Um, in adults with severe COVID-19. comes out of China, it's Wang et al. There's a whole bunch of people on this paper. Uh, I think uh, COVID-19 is gonna give us the, the record for the number of authors that we can get on any paper, seemingly we're breaking it every week. So lots and lots of people in this. And this was a, what appears to be at first glance, certainly a, a fairly well-conducted RCT. So it's a randomized control trial in patients over age um, 18. It's double-blinded and they've got a placebo there. Um, it's in Hubei province in China, which is where all of this kicked off, of course. So they took patients who were aged over 18, who'd had the disease for less than 12 days. That's kind of important because if you're going to have an effect, then you want to treat patients early. Who had a oxygen saturation of less than 94% or a um, PF ratio of 300 millimeters of mercury, which is sort of the on the cusp of mild to moderate ARDS definitions. And what they did is they gave them a 10 day course of uh, remdesivir or placebo. Loading dose, I think was 200 and then 100 milligrams a day for the rest of it. And um, so at face value, not a bad way to look at this really. A um, couple of problems, uh, which we'll talk about as we go along though. So I'll, I'll tell you the outcomes first, if it's okay. Their principal outcome measure was um, an improvement on of two points on a six point scale and the six point scale ranged from sort of death to being absolutely fine I think four was in hospital on oxygen so they were looking for people to improve by two and of course you got censored as a either a success or a failure if you either died or were discharged from hospital halfway through it was done as an intention to treat which again is something that we like and so you know, they tried to do their best. The problem, I suppose, number one is, and when, before we get to the results, is they had to close this trial early because basically they ran out of patients, which is a great success for social distancing, but is a bit of a, I mean, you can imagine the researchers going, oh my God, you know, people are getting better. It's going to ruin my trial, um, which is, I'm only being silly, but essentially what they did manage to do is they got through um, 237 patients randomized, of which they analyzed 236 and the headline figures is there is, according to this study, no difference in the time to clinical improvement. And there just isn't, you know, the, the figure they got was a hazard ratio of 1.23, quite, quite large confidence intervals, because as I say, they'd run out of patients, but it really didn't show any effect. The, the interest really has been around some of the secondary outcomes. So they did do quite a few of these, as many of these papers are doing, but they didn't really see any difference in ventilatory days. They didn't see any difference in deaths. Uh, they didn't see any difference in viral load between these two. And I think that's really important because the purported mechanism is it's going to reduce your viral load. So they didn't see any difference in the pathophysiological effect and they didn't see anything in the clinical. However, there was a difference which they talked about in the conclusion and people are making a big deal of, and I can't really see why, that the time to improvement of the secondary outcome of those who did was 18 days with remdesivir and 23 days with placebo. But that was a statistically non-significant result. But yet it's appeared, it's appeared in their conclusion and people are getting really excited about it. I just don't get it. So my conclusion for this trial is that in this group of patients, they fail to show a difference. And yes, it's absolutely right that we should continue to look at this drug. It's got some potential. Um, we maybe look at a different population. We might want to give it early. We might want to look at maybe a more severe group because this was mostly mild, mild end of um, patients. But at the moment, there still is not an indication to give red disavir on the basis of this trial outside of a future RCT. Terrific. And what maybe caused the controversy around this was that actually on the same day this was published, Gilead, the company that manufactures remdesivir, issued a statement about its uh, US trial. I believe there are two US trials in severe patients and in moderate patients, and they're not published yet. But Gilead came out with a statement that one of the trials, at least, is positive. Yeah, I've seen that. And um, it all went to the top of the White House and all that kind of stuff. But uh, quite frankly, show me the data. Show me the money. Show me the money. And then I'll, I'll look at it. And if I need to change my mind completely by next week, I will happily do that. You know, we have to be evidence-based, 
gymnasts at the moment. We have to be so agile in changing our mind and moving with the evidence and doing what the best that we can until we know better and then do it better. My Angelou, this is a good example. I'm happy to change my mind. Show me the money. The other yeah, thing with the US trials. Like on, Charlie. Sorry, sorry, Rick. The other thing with the US trials is they changed their primary outcome halfway through one of them. So the, one of the good things about large RCTs in the, in the current age is that they all get registered on uh, trial registries. So clinicaltrials.gov is a large one. And one of these trials is registered there. And you can track that they changed their primary outcome halfway through. Now, when we see the manuscript later, it might transpire that there's a good reason. But it is uh, a cause for concern. And we'll need to see a good explanation of why that was done halfway through the trial a bit later on so i believe also, that may have been because of the who guidance on using ordinal outcomes which might explain why they changed their primary outcome but i agree at first glance that does look a bit suspect sorry Paul, you wanted to come in i was going to say what surprised me was that after this the fda approved it for use as an emergency medicine and gilead have sent their entire stocks out across the united states in a sort of humanitarian gesture and yet there's no real published data to support its use yeah, science is uh, under threat uh, yeah that's exactly right i think with the, with the the quest for agility we perhaps abandoned the evidence a little bit because we had the only trial we've seen published is a negative one and yet there's this reaction so I suppose in future journal clubs, we're going to be appraising that US trial, maybe next week, who knows? The only thing to briefly point, perhaps a slightly positive thing is, is that the, again, not, not properly evidence-based, but they did anecdotally say that, that especially if patients were treated within 10 days of symptoms, then it seemed to be having more of a positive effect. And you just wonder whether, you know, a bit like Tamiflu, isn't it? That if you treat early with, with it, it, it's a bit more, works a bit better it's effective yeah 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 it's also a great marketing tool to say that if you treat early it's better so treat everybody <laughs> treat them now yeah, yeah. But, but of course the u.s um invested an awful lot of money in this drug uh, as a treatment for ebola as part of their homeland defense uh, against using ebola as a as a bioterrorist weapon and it didn't work for ebola so i'm sure gilead would be really pleased if they can show some benefit for this drug. Got big so on the questions, we had one point from uh, Abdo Khoury, uh, president of USAM, who um, noted that the finding apparently in the US trial is that the difference is time to recovery of 15 days in the control group versus 11 days in the remdesivir group, although we believe no difference in mortality. Um, so we'll, we'll see when we get that evidence to appraise. We've got other questions from uh, Richard. Was the stu study still adequately powered given the reduced numbers, Simon? So I think they calculated the power. I think Salim Razid did it actually. Um, the power was a 58% to detect a difference with the numbers that they got and their initial attempt was 85%. So it's, it's relatively underpowered. But again, go and have a look at the data yourself. And they've got the, the hazard, the, the hazard uh, curves and just look at it. it it doesn't really seem to have a big effect so it doesn't look like one of those trials where there is an effect but we just can't see it the two lines are heading in pretty much the same direction and uh, samuel noted that uh, Forsey has been talking about the impact on mortality approaching statistical significance in the u.s trial sigh p equals 0 0.05 <laughs> <laughs> and move on <laughs> Okay, so on that, we'll move on to our next paper, which is about another uh, really interesting new treatment um, where there's also a lot of excitement. And this is about convalescent plasma. So uh, I think, Paul, you're going to take us through this one. Yeah, another topical one. And National Health Service, Blood Transfusion Service, the FDA in the United States and the European Commission have all issued guidance on collection of uh, convalescent plasma from patients. And yet, is there actually a role for it? We know that for uh, we can use immunoglobulins for passive immunization, which are designed to give you immediate protection from infection before you encounter a viral infection. We've got good examples for rabies, for hepatitis B, for varicella, 
Um, and of course, measles, we also use no pooled normal immune globulin as a, as a prophylactic measure. There is an example for a respiratory virus infection of using antibody treatment as a passive immunization before you encounter infection. And that's to use uh, a humanized monoclonal antibody, palazumab, palazumab, and that's designed to protect against respiratory syncytial virus infection. Giving plasma once you have established disease is the more controversial results. It was probably first used after the First World War in response to Spanish flu. And it's been used in various uh, pandemics since then, H1N1, and there was also the avian flu in influenza. Uh, it was used in treatment of patients with that infection. It's been used in SARS and it's been used in Ebola. And when you look at the results of those studies, the, the outcomes are a bit mixed. It's quite hard to see if there's very clear benefit from the use of, of plasma. In this study, they have a total of five publications, which they have reviewed, 27 patients in all, four of them were done in China, one in South Korea. All the patients were supposed to show clinical improvement. Um, they all survived treatment and there was, there was a reducing amount of, of viral RNA detected through the, through the course. But of course, there was no arm to show that um, if you didn't do this intervention, the, the viral RNA would not, would not reduce in any way. They did see improvement in um, temperature reduction, in lung lesion um, revision, in ARDS, and the patients all survived and the ones that were on the ventilator were weaned off the ventilator. Difficulties with it, amount of plasma that was given to the individual patients varied from 200 mils up to 2.4 liters. All of the patients were on combinations of one or more antiviral drugs. Some of them also received antibacterials and antifungal agents. And it's quite hard to assess whether there's any real benefit from the administration of plasma because of the mix of patients. But what they conclude is we need proper randomized clinical trials, which I would support. One thing that strikes me about it though in the review is that they do not mention whether the benefit is not so much that you're giving neutralizing antibodies to patients with the disease and that's affecting the viral replication, or whether it's just a general effect that we see when we give immunoglobulin to patients of reducing the inflammatory immune response. And that actually what you're seeing is the administration of, of, of plasma is affecting the cytokine response and that's damping down the, the adverse pathology within the lung. And would you actually see the same effect if you just gave normal pooled immunoglobulin to these patients as convalescent plasma? That would be an interesting trial to do. So I'm not convinced at the moment. <laughs> well, again, I've learned something new because I thought that if we could show benefit with convalescent plasma, then it'd be a no brainer that monoclonal antibodies would work but actually you're saying that there may be more to it than that which is which is really interesting yeah so um there are some trials afoot on convalescent plasma simon you're leading the recovery trial in uh, at our hospital and i believe that we're going to be adding a potentially adding a convalescent plasma arm and some talk of it i don't think convalescent plasma arm is in recovery is it it might be things change on a daily basis so you might be ahead of me maybe but, just um, we put the tocilizumab in um uh, last week um i think the uh, the plasma trial is coming out of cardiff i think it might be i think it might be a separate trial rather than put into recovery but who knows so um and any other thoughts on this from the panel i mean this is going to be a, a very interesting treatment uh, there was, there's been uh, i mean it's going to be quite logistically difficult to source enough plasma if it's shown to be uh, a successful treatment as well. Yeah. <laughs> and the other point, I guess, is I mean, is when you source it, because there's, there's talk of it. You know, patients who have had 
previous coronavirus infection, not having a long lasting immunity. So does it matter when you sample a patient for their plasma? Yeah, and, and, and the quality of the, uh, of the antibodies, the, the level of neutralizing antibodies, presumably would need to be high for it to have an effect on the virus. And that would need to be quality controlled in the plasma preparations. And I don't think we're there yet. <laughs> It comes back again to the, the real urgent need we've got for a, for a good, robust, proven antibody test so that we can actually start to do some of these studies and find out how long it lasts and all of those sort of things. Yeah, yeah and we're starting to see those appear. Uh, Abbott has got, and Rush have both got FDA approved antibody tests now, but with limited data and there's a preprint of one of them. So maybe we'll be looking at that next week actually to have a look at uh, the data on accuracy of the antibody testing. Um, so that's great, a very promising treatment, really nice review of the uh, evidence from Paul. Um, and so again, just uh, good reason to temporary excitement at the moment based on the evidence, we need that RCT before we can get too excited. So let's move on to the uh, next paper, which Charlie's going to take us through. Uh, it's around the issue of renin angiotensin inhibitors. Uh, so ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, There's been lots of discussion about whether they might do some harm and then later there was some discussion about whether they might be beneficial for patients with COVID. Uh, and this paper is trying to answer that question for us. Yeah, so uh, today's year I looked at ACE inhibitors and COVID-19. As Rick said, it's a really hot topic. Um, and that's because uh, on one hand, it's thought they might do harm. COVID-19 binds to the ACE2 receptor. Um, and that has been that is known to be upregulated in type 2 diabetes, hypertension, but also um, with ACE inhibitor use. Uh, the other um, effect is it might be beneficial taking an ACE inhibitor. Um, it is thought that it might interfere with some of the negative effects around angiotensin 2, uh, strong vasoconstriction, pro-inflammatory effects and some pro-fribotic effects. So there's, as Rick said, we don't really know if it's good or bad, but classically in acute illnesses, we've always stopped ACE inhibitors. Um, so Tadeshi et al. sent a letter to the editor, and it was a prospective cohort study uh, from it, Italy. It looked at patients from the 22nd of um, February through to early April. Their primary outcome was looking at inpatient mortality, and they examined uh, 609 patients, of which 311 had hypertension. They conducted a multivariate analysis, which is nice because you can adjust for different factors within it. Um, and those factors were comorbidities, age, they used QSOFA score um, for, as a marker of physiological severity, which we'll come to in a minute. And they also looked at the chronic use of um, ACE inhibitors. Um, they found in their analysis that uh, the use of ACE inhibitors was not associated with death. They found a hazard ratio of 0.97. Uh, with a confidence interval overlapping one. There are some issues with this study. Uh, one, QSOFA might not actually work in COVID-19. Um, Ferrari et al. did an analysis and it didn't look like it was a very good discriminator. So that adjustment in the multivariate analysis might not have been as good as we think. Um, the other issue of this study is, uh, did the patient continue to take the ACE inhibitor during their inpatient stay? Like I said before, it's normally stopped. This data, it doesn't seem to be presented here. Um, and also they only really examined 311 of their 609 patients. Uh, so that makes me inclined to believe that this might be a sub-study and might be a post hoc analysis plan, but that's not clear from the short manuscript that we have. I think um, some take homes of this is this study indicates that the chronic use of ACE inhibitors probably isn't associated with an increased mortality. That is in keeping with a large body of evidence which is beginning to build behind this. Um, Mandeep et al. looked at a retrospective cohort of nearly 9,000 patients and showed no increased risk with chronic use. Um, and Zhang et al. looked at a retrospective cohort of 1,000, just over 1,100 patients and uh, showed the same effect of no increased risk of death when using an ACE inhibitor. And in fact, Zhang et al. showed that if you continue to take the ACE inhibitor in hospital, um, it doesn't increase your mortality as well. So this paper and those papers just mentioned represent an evolving pathophysiology, pathophysiology with this data set. Um, and also it brings me back to sort of a, a classic manuscript line, which is that we probably need more research with larger RCTs to truly figure out what's going on 
but some of the early concerns we had about ACE inhibitors may not transpire to be warranted. And I also mentioned the paper by Meta and Al in New England Journal of Medicine, which has just come out, where they've done... Um, so a lot of the, the worry at the beginning was they did a univariate analysis in, in patients, and that suggested that if you were on an ACE inhibitor, is bad news. But then they, didn't, they couldn't answer the question, why are you on it? Are you on it for heart failure? In which case, there could be an association. So now we're starting to get this paper you described and the, the one in the New England Journal of Medicine where they've got a multivariate analysis and they can pick out whether it's just the ACE inhibitor or whether it's the disease that it's been prescribed for. And certainly in the NEGM one, which is, I think, oh, what about just under 9,000 patients, um, there doesn't appear to be any association. In fact, it may well be beneficial again. So it's flipped, hasn't it? So all those people I know who um, came off their ACE inhibitors and went onto calcium channel blockers are now going back onto their ACE inhibitors. So, you know, got to move with the evidence. Hmm. Yeah, so what we under, what we do this week is maybe totally different to what we do next week, and um, but we have to update it based on the emerging evidence. There's a question from uh, Abilash just saying, can we get a link to this paper, please? Um, I, just to note, all the links are, pasted at, are posted at St. Emlyn's blog, so stemlinsblog.org. If you go there, we've posted, it. Ian Beardsell has created a, a blog post for us, which has all the links to the papers for you there. So in the meantime, what are we going to do? You, based on this evidence, Charlie, you said you need, we need some more definitive research. We haven't got it yet. So what should we do today or tomorrow for the patient who comes in on an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker with fairly serious COVID? Do we continue it? So I think there are two questions here. The one is the um, people in the community on ACE inhibitors, should they continue to take it? And the other is what we do in the acute setting. This paper from Tadishi et al. just looked at people who were on it chronically and didn't really comment on the, an inpatient stay. Um, I think there is no evidence of harm for the community use of ACE inhibitors. Um, so I think from a tentative agile evidence-based medicine perspective, uh, you could say that the use of ACE inhibitors in the community uh, should continue on the strength of previous evidence of benefit to the people it's being prescribed to, because there's no new evidence of harm. In the inpatient setting, there's, there is a pre-existing evidence that using ACE inhibitors in the acutely unwell patient can cause harm. Um, and there's some retrospective data now, mainly from Zhang et al, that, it, that ACE inhibitors in COVID-19 might be beneficial. But in my mind, that retrospective might does not uh, overrule the known harm of ACE inhibitors for general acute illness. So I think it's essentially carry on as we were before. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Um, just very quickly, there's a question from Peter. Um, does the continuing use of ACE inhibitors impact on the subsequent need for renal replacement therapy in this uh, study? So I don't, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go through it with a fine tooth, tooth comb again later, but I don't think they actually comment on renal replacement therapy in this study. It's a short letter to the editor. Um, and in the other um, papers that I've uh, read, the ones that Sal and I have quoted, I haven't um, noted any particular comment on renal replacement therapy. And that's actually a really good point. Is are we protecting against more severe outcomes, but does everyone need to go on dialysis? That would be a really important side effect and harm to capture. Okay. Thanks, Charlie. So we'll move on to our last paper, which I'm going to summarise. Um, I thought this was a really important paper to, to summarise because of the size of the study. Um, so this is from the Isaric uh, study. They've been collecting data from patients with uh, confirmed COVID in the UK, well, England, Scotland and Wales, uh, since the outbreak started, so I think since uh, February. And they've taken a data cut in April um, when they've uh, managed to recruit 16,749 patients. And they've got the data from patients' hospital records about their demographics, their comorbidities, their outcome, and they've summarized it for us. So it's epidemiological data that could help us to understand uh, what's predicting outcome in patients with COVID. So of those patients, that accounts for, by the way, 28% of all of the patients with confirmed COVID in the UK through this outbreak. They presented quite early, I thought. The medium time from symptom onset to presentation in hospital was four days, which uh, seemed early to me. Uh, and they stayed an average of seven days in the hospital. So 
fairly long hospital admissions, as you'd expect, and 17% of them required critical care, so high dependency unit or ICU care. Uh, the mean age of patients was 72, as you'd expect, and only 2% of the patients, that's 239 in total, were actually below 18. Um, so as, as we, we understood from what the data that was emerging, this is very rare in children. In terms of the symptoms that patients present with, they fell into really three key groups. The respiratory symptoms, cough, fever, shortness of breath, as we, uh, as we know, they're the most common. Also systemic features like myalgia, fatigue, and joint pain, they were the next common. And then thirdly, there were the enteric symptoms. So you've got diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and they were actually surprisingly quite common. Now, uh, as a lone symptom, it only affected something like 5% of the patients. Uh, but again, it just shows us that we've got to be on, on our guard when we have patients with unexplained gastrointestinal symptoms during this pandemic. Now, they followed patients through to see how many were successfully discharged from hospital. And bear in mind that some of them are still go going through their care episodes, so we don't know the final outcome. But only 49% of patients were actually discharged from hospital in this cohort. Uh, that's 55% of the patients who were admitted to a ward, then discharged home, and only 20% of the patients who've been admitted to ICU have been successfully discharged, and that's despite them having a younger median age at 61. And then finally, the perhaps one of the most interesting things uh, for our future practice is to decide is to, is to realize what the predictors of mortality are. And in this study, male sex was a predictor of mortality, coexisting cardiac disease, COPD, chronic kidney disease a history of malignancy, obesity, and dementia were all of the uh, predictors. So they're all the factors that were associated with adverse prognosis in this huge UK cohort. Uh, you could argue nothing hugely new there that we didn't know from the Chinese series, but it's really important to have UK data and such a massive cohort of patients. So there we go. Any thoughts from the panel on that? First up from me is just... Um what an incredible study to produce at such short notice and it's really good um, and clear evidence that I, I, I'm totally impressed with what we've done in the UK and the NHR about having these trials ready and waiting to go. I know ISARIC wasn't a, a, a UK trial but the idea of you have hibernating trials and trials like this which are in process and ready to go is is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Real testament to uh, our capacity to deliver research at a huge scale. I guess from a critical appraisal standpoint, there's always one question about how good the data is that's coming in. And there was one number that really jumped out at me in, the, in this paper, which was that 4% of these patients were asymptomatic, but these are all admitted patients. So how the, why the heck would you be admitted to the hospital if you have no symptoms at all? Um, so either I'm missing something there, or maybe that's a hint. Like some, some other databases have had a bunch of people with ectopic pregnancies who have negative beta HCG. It just doesn't make sense. I wonder whether that's a hint that there's something wrong with the underlying data. I think it might be that we often admit patients, say, with renal colic, and you do the CT scan and you really have got COVID-19. Um, we're picking up quite a lot of patients in that way who don't necessarily have the symptoms, but they've got it. But are, would those patients be asymptomatic? I mean, you still had, you know, like, because then you wonder whether there's a tie between COVID and renal colic. Uh, I, I'd want to know, do they have truly no symptoms or like, what are their, their symptoms? Fair comment. I don't, I don't think we've been doing many routine scans where we've been picking it up. So there must have been something. You're absolutely right. Yeah, a really good point. Maybe a problem with the granularity of the data that was collected and perhaps they didn't foresee that. So there perhaps weren't the options to put those symptoms in or they've just been coded as asymptomatic when actually they had non-COVID symptoms. It's a good point though. Okay, so we're at time. Um, it's I think time for us to wrap up, I think. So I'd like to say a massive thanks again to our uh, fantastically expert panel. It's been brilliant as usual and special thanks to Justin for joining us at 6.30 in the morning in Toronto. So thanks, thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to have you on the, on the Journal Club. So Charlie, last point, we'd like to shout out about the RCHEM top fives and a call for surveillance on new papers. Yeah, so if anyone's seen uh, an interesting or new paper and you think it would be of benefit to emergency medicine uh, clinicians around the country, then please submit it. Uh, the Google form will go up on Twitter shortly after this and just 
pop in the title, your name and a brief paragraph, and we're uh, endeavouring to include every external paper submitted, um, with obviously with some caveats, um, on our publications, which include the top five that goes out to all our chem members every week, and also a director's cut edition, which is a joint thing between St. Emblem's and our chem learning. So please, everyone, get involved. If you see an interesting paper, submit it through the form you'll find on Twitter later. Thanks, Charlie. It's been a huge amount of work for Charlie to put that together, and uh, we're really grateful for all your submissions. So keep them coming. It really does help us to stay on top of the latest evidence. So on that note, uh, I'd like to close. Um, we do have another journal club scheduled for next week. I think we're back to the time, regular time of 11 a.m. Um, we'll finalise that and put it out via the St. Emlyn's blog and Twitter. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week. Take care of yourselves, and we hope to see you next week. Bye.